last week Rosario had asked about Jehovah's Witnesses and communion. So for Jehovah's Witnesses, communion or the Eucharist is strictly a remembrance and expression of gratitude to Jesus for his sacrifice on our behalf. So it falls into the, oh, that Jesus, what a nice guy school. Uh, so they argue that the Last Supper was held on the Passover as a Passover meal. So it was a, a corresponds to the Jewish Seder. Um, in fact, it either was a Seder or it may have been held the day before, but you know, sort of close enough. Um, and they argue that the early church only celebrated uh, communion, the Eucharist, the remembrance, whatever you'd like to call it, only once a year on you know, the anniversary of the Seder. And so their source for that was, was two articles and two encyclopedias published in the 19th century. One of them was, was written by Philip Schaff and someone else whose name I don't remember. Philip Schaff was a very eminent reformed uh, theologian and historian. He translated a whole number of works. If, if anyone has seen the sort of three series set on the writings of the anti of the anti Nicene fathers the, and two series on the post Nicene fathers, uh, those were translated predominantly by Philip Schaff. So a very um, eminent Calvinist theologian and church historian. And the second was by, uh, so I read the entry on Easter, which they referred to in his uh, encyclopedic volume. And the second was from Strong and Somebody. Strong uh, is a person who is, was the original author of Strong's Concordance. I think he also was reformed, uh, but also a, a very eminent you know, scholar of, of, uh, of the Bible and, and especially of, of, uh, of Greek and Hebrew. So, so the interesting thing here is that in, in, at least in the article that I re read on Easter, there was a discussion of Know, sort of when Easter should be, the difference in the Western church and the, the uh, Eastern church's dating of Easter and kind of the sort of conflict and the discussion about that. Uh, th there was uh, you know, a discussion of when the Last Supper was held. So, you know, the year in which Jesus died, um, the general candidates being 30 or 33. And then there was a discussion of the Last Supper, but there was nothing that said that the early church celebrated it only once a year. So they completely misread the article. And that became you know, the basis for their, their practice. So, so the Last Supper is only so, or the remembrance or communion is only supposed to be celebrated once a year. Uh, on the plus side, they do criticize um, um, our other separated brethren for not using wine because wine is an essential ingredient of the remembrance. And so um, they, um, so you can't, only 144,000 people can consume the Eucharist or communion or the remembrance or whatever we want to call it. Because those, one, and of course those 144,000 are of Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're not, you know, all Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, because those 144,000 are 
from the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, there are the 144,000 who have been called in a special way uh, by God and will rule with Christ in heaven. So um, they uh, have a, uh, a it, it's an interesting you know, sort of interpretation because they have no sense of, of uh, symbolism and no sense of biblical numerology and no sense of, you know, sort of magnitudes. Um, if, if they were, since they were drawing on you know, uh, Reformation or a Calvinist, uh, you know, scholars, you would have thought that they would have kind of looked up 144,000 in E.W. Bullinger's work on, on numerology, which is kind of like the the standard work, Bullinger was really another eminent Calvinist um, biblical scholar. So 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 1,000. 12 for the 12 tribes, 12 for divine completion. So double divine completion, if you will, double the 12 tribes times a thousand, which is a whole lot. And uh, so those represent the Jews drawn into the kingdom of God. And, but, but then of the Gentiles, there are thousands upon thousands, Revelation tells us, uh, <clears throat> a number too large to count. But once we get into thousands, the point isn't that something is going to be a thousand, it's going to be a whole lot. Like for example, Christ's millennial reign, uh, many of our separated brethren interpret it as being a thousand years, but that's lunacy. It simply is a long time. We are now living in Christ's millennial reign, the thousand years of Christ's reign. And as we know that there, it's closely approaching 2,000 years. It simply means a long time. So this kind of excessive literalism as well as sloppiness with sources is, uh, is, is sort of really striking. And um, well, Sloppiness with sources and excessive literalism is, you know, what can I say? Not good. So. Thank you. Yeah. So we were discussing John's bread of life discourse, and we noticed that uh, the Last Supper is detailed in the synoptics, but not in John. Does anyone have any? idea of why that might be. In some ways, this goes right to the heart of what's the problem with the Jehovah's Witnesses interpretation. Now that you say, now that you say that, it's some, only some of them can um, have the, the, it's not communion, the Eucharist, you said, or the, they, in their, in their service, they only pass the bread yeah. Person by person, and just I don't remember. It is also the it is the wine or is the um, grape juice something like that. It, it, I it don't is, remember. It is, it is wine. Ah, uh, yeah, it and they wine. just pass it person to person, but nobody can. Yeah, they can. On, they only, can touch it. Only if yeah, you're one of. Know. Only if you're one of the one hundred forty-four thousand. And you take the wine? Yeah, then you can consume the Eucharist, but otherwise not. So John was part of that? No, no. We're back to Rosario's question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so sorry. So the Eucharist, the Last Supper is not in John because John was writing at around 100 quite late okay shortly before his death 
whereas the synoptic gospels were all written earlier, probably in the 60s, in each case before the destruction of the temple, although you know, scholar, many scholars dispute this, but I think that's you know, the soundest conclusion. So by the time uh, John wrote his gospel, the Eucharist was well established. So the question, so in many ways, you know, the, the synoptics present Jesus' words and, you know, sort of an attempt to define the ritual of the Eucharist. But since it's already established, John's, and, and since much of the mass is established and John's, and, you know, the, the uh, practices of the church are fairly established, at least in a general way. John's focus is on theology, you know, rather than uh, much more explicitly on theology and especially on mystical theology, uh, rather than, you know, some combination of theology and, and practice. So, so his substitute for the Last Supper is the bread of life discourse. And, and you know, as we started to see last week, it's a little bit uh, further ranging because he also discusses Jesus as the word of God, Jesus as, as divine teacher. But so where we left off, we were beginning to discuss misunderstanding in John because there's an evident case of misunderstanding in the bread of life discourse. So there are two, really two models for uh, misunderstanding. Uh, Raymond Brown, who was the eminent scholar of, of John's gospel and John's writings, identified like eight cases of misunderstanding. And they sort of, one of them is sort of, so they fall into two patterns, one, one of which is unique, a pattern of one. So let's take a look at that and then take a look at the second case of mis uh, at a second misunderstanding, which you know, conforms to the, the second pattern, which is everything else but the bread of life discourse. So the first is Jesus cleansing of the temple. Right at the beginning. So uh, let's start at verse 18. It's John chapter 3, verse 18. So as context here, uh, Jesus has transformed the water into wine at Cana. Um, and then he goes to the Passover in Jerusalem. Um, in John's gospel, Jesus' ministry is three years. He goes to Jerusalem for the first year. He does not go to Jerusalem for the second year. And then he goes to Jerusalem, Jerusalem again for the third year because his time has come. And, and so he goes to Jerusalem to die. Um, so he goes to Jerusalem and he takes a whip and goes into the temple and drives out the money changers and uh, the people selling animals. Okay, so chapter two, verse 18. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So, Jesus doesn't respond. There's a clear 
misunderstanding. His opponents think he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem and he's not. He's talking about his resurrection and being raised from the dead after three days. So, uh, so Jesus doesn't respond at all. Does anyone have any idea why he doesn't respond? Maybe because he's he was um, because they didn't understood correctly, and he said like, "Oh, it's, <laughs> I don't have nothing else to say because you don't understand." Maybe I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. If if so, what he's what <clears throat> what he's basically saying is that he is the temple, right? Which means he's replaced the temple. So, if we read, you know, look throughout John's gospel. Uh, Jesus is always very concerned with whether his hour has yet come. And then when he realizes his hour has come, uh, when, when, there's a, uh, when he finds that some Gentiles want to see him, he decides his hour has come and then goes to Jerusalem to die. But he doesn't want to die before his hour has come. So the thing is that if he explains this, that he's the temple, what's going to happen? They're going to... He's going to die. I mean, that's, yeah. that's blasphemous. That's outrageous mm -hmm. to claim that he's the temple. So, or that he replaces the temple. So, practically unwise, best to hold one's tongue. So let's look at the but second. John, yeah, but John did switch it though. I mean, all the other the other three gospels have it right near the end where he where he, you know, right. his time has come. Right. So. Right. And, and and so so the fact that he cleanses in the, the synoptics, he cleanses uh the temple last. It's it's one of the last acts of his public ministry before he has a number right. of hostile exchanges with his opponents and then uh, celebrates the Passover meal or the Last Supper and is then apprehended and tried and crucified. So it's- So this it's, may very well have been the last thing he did before they, they decided right. that it, we're done. Right, John yeah. has almost certainly rearranged it uh, for theological reasons, because John wants, John begins by, so this is the first real act of Jesus' public ministry. And we can consider the wine at Cana really a sort of a private act. Um, so this is the first public act of Jesus' ministry. And John is doing it because he wants to make it clear that Jesus is the temple and not only is Jesus the temple, Jesus himself replaces all of the traditions of Jewish worship and all of the traditions of Jewish worship point to Jesus. So for example, Jesus also goes to the Feast of Tabernacles which culminates in the Festival of Lights with a parade you know, with torches and light to from a, a outside of the temple into the temple. Uh, and that's the basis for uh, Jesus as the light of the world. So Jesus, you know, in all cases, replaces uh, the, the uh, institutions of Jewish worship and replaces, first of all, the temple, which is you know, the primary institution of Jewish worship. So, then we have the encounter with Nicodemus, and that is in chapter three. Yes. <laughs> Let's take a look and see what how. Word? Chapter three, verse one. Yeah. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
The man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he, was, when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus understands that very, very literally. He means you know, literal rebirth from one's mother's womb. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you, where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And, and we can really stop there. The, the, the point is that Nicodemus is understanding this li very literally as a second physical birth. And Jesus is speaking about a spiritual birth from the Holy Spirit. And so Nicodemus can't uh, fathom that. And so at that point, Jesus becomes impatient and, um, you know, sort of uh, questions Nicodemus's authority as a teacher of Israel. So, but, but there's an attempt to engage Nicodemus to correct his misunderstanding. And then when when he doesn't, Jesus moves on. So with that in view, let's move again to the bread of life discourse in John's gospel, which is uh, chapter John's six, part of verse 48. Previously, up to this point, Jesus as the bread of life, um, verse 45 talks about uh, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father so in the patristic tradition, this is seen as basically Jesus as the word of God and as the wisdom of God, which is a theme that is very uh, predominant in John's gospel. And then Jesus switches gears a bit to uh, food, starting in verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So you notice they're questioning what Jesus is saying. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And jump to 58. Uh, no, we don't have to. As the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. 
This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who these were that did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. So what relationship does this have to the previous two, two patterns of misunderstanding? Obviously, Jesus responds, so it doesn't fit the first pattern. Does it fit the second pattern? Well, in both cases, they take them literally. Mm -hmm. Right, in both cases, they take them literally. So does he correct their misunderstanding in the bread of well, life? He tried um, but they still took it literally. <laughs> so, um, but then when he talked to his own disciples just after this, um, Peter at least he understood him. He said, "Who, who, who else should we go to? I mean, you're the Son of God." Seems like in both cases, Jesus was kind of taken aback at the fact that they were not understanding. Well, actually, instead of not understanding, they did understand. That's the problem. Well, the 12 understood, but did the, did the rest of his disciples um of the 70 that he had picked out and everything, did they understand? Yeah. Didn't sound like, it didn't sound like they did. It doesn't well, sound like they did. I mean, the 70 aren't here. So this is an unspecified group, probably of a large number of disciples. And well, also it's it not necessarily clear that, that, uh, that the 12 apostles understood either. I mean, Peter doesn't indicate so much an understanding as a recognition that uh, Jesus is an authoritative teacher. Jesus has the words of eternal life. And so where else is there to go, you know, whether you like it or not. But the 12 were still there because it says that the 12. Right, right, the, the 12 were still there. The 12, right. yeah. So they, they knew that he was talking, he well, wasn't talking. Well, we don't necessarily know that they knew, uh, you know, they're there. Right, they, they were still there, they didn't walk away. They stayed, they didn't walk away. Yeah. But, yeah. but what they knew, I mean, you know, through in, in all of the gospels, we find, you know, that there are yeah. limits they're of their and knowledge. <laughs> and right, they're up and down and, you know, that they in many ways really grow only after Jesus has died and uh, because they didn't under totally understand what he was talking about until after he died right exactly until after the resurrection everything all of this went on and then they truly didn't have any kind of a reference point or anything until right. um, then then when they had some kind then they got enlightened or whatever and they realized all of the things that he had said afterwards they received the Holy Spirit right Right. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. So, so, so the, 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 the important thing here is that there is no real misunderstanding. So yes, they, they take Jesus speaking about his flesh and blood in a very literal sense. And Jesus means it in 
a less literal sense, but nevertheless, um, you know, sort of looking at the way in which he responds. Um, well, is this kind of, you know, does this have to do with, is it related to him uh, admonishing them for refusing to see the light when talking about how when people are given the light, uh, they refuse it and want to hang back into the darkness rather than, than... Um... No, no. Oh, okay. No. Let's, let's take a look at... Um... At, oh my goodness. Uh, I have a question. I have a question. So uh -huh. if the uh, Hebrew culture that says uh, here, I'm reading here says uh, flesh and um, it was a meaning in, was a total meaning for of the men and his condition and his mortal con condition, Jesus, um, Jesus wanted to have all ourselves in communion with his divinity and says that um, for the Hebrews, the flesh and the blood was um, the, the mortal condition. It is the total mortal condition. So it is, um, they understood properly or or they didn't want to understand as they as the Jesus was was explaining they the question well, sorry that's the question with the with the people uh, do you remember that my friend told me so you you are saying that you are um that you really you really believe that is the 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 flesh and the blood of Jesus. So that means that you are um, an evil? Uh -huh. Something like that that she was referring me. So they take um, the in the way that they that is convenient for them? Um, well, yes. And I mean, they're, they're taking it excessively literally. But um, but that's That's the way he wanted them to understand it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, he means it. He means it in a spiritual sense, but nevertheless, a very real sense that it is. So, in, you know, in, in, in the language of the scholastics, we consume the essence of. Christ's flesh and blood, or the essence of Christ's body. So the, the actual physical flesh and the actual physical blood of Jesus are not present because those are merely properties of Jesus. But what we are consuming is the essence of Jesus. And so that's why the bread and the wine are, remain visible because those are only the properties of the bread and wine. Those are, Aquinas refers to those as accidents. So accidents remain, the essence changes. But the point here is that if we look at Jesus' response, it's a clear statement of the real presence. So, so first of all, um, most basically eating, separating. So there's a notion of the wholeness of the person in Judaism. You know, so flesh, blood, mind, soul, those are all part of a totality that are not separatable. They can't, you can't, you know, 
take apart, take out somebody's mind and can't take out their blood. That's, it defines, you know, one's existence. It's a totality that is integral. And so when you speak about uh, blood, uh, body and blood, flesh and blood, you're speaking about death necessarily because those elements become separate. That to do that requires that you be dead. So that's somewhat disturbing. Now, so the pattern of misunderstanding with Nicodemus, and then we also see that say with the Samaritan woman at the well who Jesus encounters is that he tries to explain what he means. And you know, he's more very patient, especially with the Samaritan woman. But here they say, uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So um, in verse 51, he has said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word for flesh is sarx in Greek. Sarx is a, it has two kind of usages. It can be, so to view this as Jesus is speaking metaphorically as in, you know, do this in remembrance of me, eat my flesh in, you know, some kind of nice way. And it's, uh, you know, think about how I suffered and died on the cross or, you know, have fond recollections or whatever. Um, but the... Um, the um, first use of a, um, sarks can be used um, sort of metaphorically, but when it's used metaphorically, it's used to um, to um, pronounce judgment on evil. You know, so God pours out his wrath on all flesh. Somehow my notes are not quite where uh, I thought they were. So I'm going to have to largely do this from memory. But so if we were to argue that, you know, Jesus use, yeah, Jesus' use of sarks here is metaphorical, then we would have to be saying that Jesus is evil and that God is punishing him for his sin. But obviously in Christian theology, Jesus is the son of God who is sinless. So that use of sarks becomes totally inappropriate. So the other use of sarks is, in, uh, as, is as a very graphic uh, word. It means literally flesh, right? And so Jesus um, is using a very graphic, very literal word, sarks. So then, so notice in, in verse 51, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The word he used for, uses for eats is fago. Fago means, you know, to eat, to dine. It's the word ordinarily associated most common Greek word for eating. Okay, so then the Jews disputed among themselves, verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, 
eat the flesh, he changes the verb to trogo. Trogo is a, a vulgar word or vulgar is too strong, off color. And it refers to animals eating, to gnawing on things, to, you know, sort of a feeding frenzy of animals. It's, uh, it's not a word that's used to fine dining. Mm -hmm. So kind of like devouring. What? Kind of like devouring. Yeah, kind of like devouring, gnawing, crunching. Yeah. Um, yeah, eating in an animalistic and you know, sort of barbarian and feeding frenzy way. Gross. So, um, so that's to chew, to crunch, to gnaw. So trogo is never used metaphorically. It's only used in two other places in the New Testament. And it's both used to refer to the operation of chewing. So he's trying to gross them out. Well, he's trying to make it clear that they didn't misunderstand they have some misunderstanding. I mean, they understand him very literally as opposed to, you know, sort of in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the spiritual versus the literal sense isn't going to make a great deal of difference <laughs> because you're still drinking blood and still eating flesh. You're still consuming mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. So he means that very literally. Then he also, um, on top of it all, so there's actually eating cannibalism is not even mentioned in you know, the Old Testament because it's so far over the pale that, you know, why bother? But drinking blood is you know, not at all, it is mentioned and it's not acceptable. Let's, uh, let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 17 verses 10 through 14. Any man of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. Therefore, I have said to the sons of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Any man also of the sons of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among them, who takes in hunting any beast or bird that may be eaten, shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For the life of every creature is the blood of it. Therefore, I have said to the sons of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So this is basically the same prohibition is found in <clears throat> chapter seven of Le Leviticus. It's found in chapters three and six in Leviticus. It's found in uh, chapter nine of Genesis. It's found in chapter 19 of Leviticus. It's found in chapters 12 and 15 of Deuteronomy. So <clears throat> not consuming blood is a biggie. One simply doesn't do it. 
And so that's what the original consternation is about in, in, uh, in the bread of life discourse. Well, well actually it's, it's not about that, it's even worse. Jesus appears to be uh, you know, saying that you'll eat my flesh, which is just totally unacceptable, even more acceptable than drinking blood. And then he doubles down and adds drinking his blood just for good measure, which makes it even worse. So he's making it clear that from his perspective, his disciples did not misunderstand. They understood only too well, and they're not willing to accept what he's saying. Does that make sense? Doesn't it really put puts his apostles in a in a um, a light where I mean they you know they're grown up with the with the Jewish um, laws and and everything and all of a sudden Jesus is coming and saying hey you know you're going to eat my blood I mean drink my blood and eat my flesh which seemingly goes against all of their traditions that they have learned. Uh huh. More than traditions, it goes against yeah, God's laws. Life. Yeah. So, um, so then, when if you are you know discussing uh, communion with one of our separated brethren, and they tell you that uh, it's uh, not to be understood at all literally that you know the real presence is. Uh, Catholic foolishness and uh, that, you know, this is, it's a symbol, then how do you respond? Because it was totally understood um, that it wasn't just symbolism and it was um, And it, ca it caused a lot of um, upheaval and consternation with his followers. Mm -hmm. If it were just a symbol, they wouldn't worry about it so much. Right. People usually don't leave because of a symbol. Right. But you can also stress that to believe it's a symbol means to be saying, implying that Jesus is evil and deserved death. So why do you want to remember in the, you know, symbolic sense of that Jesus, why do you re want to remember a criminal, a person who is guilty and deserve to be punished. And then, you know, you can suggest that we also hold remembrances for, you know, like Charles Manson and, uh, you know, whomever else, uh, you know, is particularly abhorrent because in some sense, that's what they're, they're suggesting. Well, they're seeing him as just being human too. What? Because you wouldn't eat the flesh of another human. They're seeing him and, you know, the, the laws were, you know, about um, eating the blood of animals, which a priest is offering to God. And mm -hmm. no one else can do that or touch or eat it. And then Jesus is saying, this is my blood. And he keeps saying he comes from the Father. No one can get to the Father except through him. But they're seeing him as human or at least they're seeing that he's talking about defying a human law with the mm -hmm. blood the body and blood they're not seeing his divinity 
Right, but it's are believing if, if but it's also more than his divinity because in the Eucharist there's Jesus' humanity as well as his divinity is present in yeah, the Eucharist. Right. Uh, you know, so right. in a real sense, he is advocating a violation of the Mosaic law. Okay. Intentionally, okay. By the way, the uh, I did find some of the verses with Sarks used in the sense of condemnation for evil. Uh, in Isaiah chapter nine, verse 20, it says, each devours his neighbor's flesh. The kind of dog, the, the, you know, the imagery is sort of dog eat dog. It's not to be understood literally, at least, hopefully not. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 26, oppressors eat their own flesh. So God judges them and destroys them. Their oppression becomes an act of judgment and an act of condemnation upon themselves. So they're evil and they're, they're, they eat their own flesh because they're evil. And in Micah chapter three, verses two and three, there's condemnation of the evil rulers of, of Israel. So, Sarks in a metaphorical sense always involves condemnation of evil and punishment of evil. So for this to be symbolic, Jesus, the requirement therefore would be that Jesus be evil and you know the crucifixion be his just as deserts. And in that case, obviously. Jesus can't possibly offer atonement for our sins because he can't cover his own. That leads to the synoptics and the Last Supper uh, discourse. And we have 10 minutes left. Should we get started? Or should we stop? I've got a quick question. The uh, the blood is, um, you know, the the life of the of the beast, the animal being sacrificed. Well, but with Jesus dying and having us drink His blood, it's it's giving us lot. He's giving us life by drinking His blood. Mm -hmm. so that you know it uh he can only do that because being the son of god he's not anything mortal that's you know what that's his sacrificing himself as the the sacrificial lamb giving us so we can drink his blood and eat his flesh and get life, receive life. I don't know. Right. And we'll we'll um, you know, we'll discuss that a little bit more, you know, sort of in detail. The uh, the the mass is sacrifice and the Eucharist is sacrifice. Um, after we we uh, you know, finish the uh, the biblical basis of of the Eucharist and and uh, possibly you know, look at uh, Eucharistic practice in the early church a little bit. Um, it's important uh, and look at the uh, Reformation, uh, especially both Luther and Calvin's theology of of the Eucharist. The uh, I mean, it, it's the, the important thing is that you know the the real presence. So you know, so if we compare 
Catholic Eucharistic theology with Lutheran Eucharistic theology. The, although the doctrine of the real presence is present in Lutheranism, Christ's presence is of no practical purpose. He's just, you know, kind of there and you consume him. But why do they think they, why do they think people are consuming him then? They have no answer or? No, there's no real answer. I, I don't think the, the, uh, the uh, or if there is, I've, I've forgotten it. The, uh, but for Luther, the primary, so the, the Eucharist in, in, in Catholic theology, there's, there's a branch of, of theology called sacramental, sacramental, sacrificial theology that focuses on Christ's sacrifice and Christ's sacrifice in the Eucharist and our sacrifice of ourselves. And so that's central to you know, the, the Eucharist in, in the mass or the Eucharist in the mass finds you know, its expression in, in a sacrificial theology. The um, Luther does not believe that the mass is a sacrifice. So we're remembering you know, Christ and Christ, you know, sort of has the goodness to be present bodily. Uh, but that presence is, you know, of, of no actual practical effect because the mass is not a sacrifice and there is no representation of Christ's sacrifice to before God the Father, nor are we joined in that sacrifice before God the Father. So mass is simply not a sacrifice. Is that the main reason why he broke away? Um, he broke away really he was Catholic. Yeah, he broke away pr pr uh, predominantly, you know, because of the the indulgences and oh, and right. his sense of right. his sense yeah. of uh, you know abuse and his sense that everything that was at all valuable was up for sale and. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, sacrifice becomes, you know, one more thing evidently that you can purchase. And so sacrifice, it became a, a work and, you know, works were works and payment of money were one of the ways in which were, you know, two of the ways in which you earned heaven, uh, but nothing, you know, is to be earned, can be earned. And so he, you know, he, he, I mean, fundamentally, he, he was justifiably repulsed by, you know, the, the practice of, of the church and the sale of indulgences. And, uh, but on the other hand, he went, you know, more than a bit overboard. And, you know, his, his theology as a whole was fundamentally shaped by, you know, his abhorrence at, you know, what he perceived to be um, a practice, a widespread practice of, of thinking you can earn your way into something. Um, so, I, I mean, at some level, you know, you can at least say that he had you know, the virtue of consistency, which is something, but he certainly, you know, went, went overboard with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worse that he thought, like he he must have thought that it was, that the communion was the real presence. Yeah. But he did, I'd, I'd say that was worse. That was a better reason for him to leave the Catholic church if, if that's what he did not agree with 
than than to you know focus uh -huh. it on instances. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in many ways, this rejection of ma the masses' sacrifice makes right. very little sense, and and leaves. Um, then he also has instead of transubstantiation, consubstantiation, which, you know, I mean, is uh, in, in some ways kind of. I would say nitpicky. I mean, transubstantiation, you know, is the official doctrine and makes the most sense. You know, consubstantiation isn't bad, but, you know, kind of why bother in the first place? I mean, you know, uh, but so, you know, I, I think in some ways it, it uh, I mean, he, he saw some, uh, you know, rationale in it coming from the, the uh, argument, the, the uh, monophysite controversy about Jesus' will and whether Jesus had a separate will and, or whether it, you know, melded with the will of the, of of Jesus, the son, uh, Christ, the Son of God, and so he kind of adapted the the uh, resolution of that controversy into his Eucharistic theology and rejected the scholastics. But even so, it was, you know, you know sort of, I think, nitpicky and testifies kind of to the spirit of op oppositionalism that, you know, sort of Luther had. Um, and, you know, in some ways, kind of um, excessive pride and, and, you know, egotism. Um, but, you know, at, at least he did recognize the doctrine of the real presence, however much in some, you know, mitigated form, um, unlike, unlike, um, Calvin and, and, uh, very much unlike our separated brethren today, or at least particularly you know, evangelical fundamentalists and the Baptists and post-Baptists. So we are out of time. Uh, next week, we'll do the uh, Synoptic Gospels, the Last Supper verses in the Synoptic Gospels in Paul. So we'll look at them carefully um, in terms of... Um, the language, this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in memory or remembrance of me. And we'll particularly look at the, um, in addition to, you know, looking at the, the um, words in Greek and the absence of a verb in Aramaic, which is very significant since Jesus Last Supper was, you know, Jesus uh, did the, the Last Supper prayer in Aramaic and not uh, Greek. And then, you know, the gospel writers uh, expressed it in Greek, translated it into Greek. We'll also look at remembrance. The, uh, the Greek word is anamnesis. And uh, it has a um, very distinctive meaning that does, has nothing to do with our subjective state or you know with our fond recollections or or anything like that. It's it's a, a completely unsubjective, you know, unsentimental unindividualistic uh, word and, and a very significant one. Anamnesis is <clears throat> very, very important and, and really um, critical for an understanding of, of the Eucharist. And you know, so to transform it into this you know, subjective 
thing and I'm going to, you know, fondly remember. Think about Jesus and, you know, is, you know I mean, mm -hmm. that's certainly part of what we should do. We should be grateful that Christ died, but, but that's such a minimal, you know, kind of baseline that uh, anamnesis is, it's much, much, much more, and it's central to the mass. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that next week.